and you're the only one who's struggling or suffering. And I think this is actually one of the biggest reasons that, um, that I wrote Lost and Founder is to help people feel less alone for having these challenges and these problems that, you know, this is something we universally experience. And a ton of startup success is actually just luck. All right, hey guys, you know, we have the most amazing Rand Fishkin here with us. And if you've never heard of Moss, um, you're obviously not in the SEO space. So Rand Fishkin is the founder of Moss. And recently he is the founder of Spark Toro, you know, a data and software company helping people understand you know, where to reach their target audiences. And also I'm a big fan of his new of his book, you know, Lost and Founder, a painfully honest guide to the startup world. So uh, Rand Fishkin, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, Bob. Yeah. Good to be here. So yeah, just just for for my audience, so I'm interviewing Rand on behalf of Next Academy, which I am the head of growth. So Next Academy has over two thousand graduates for digital marketing and um, coding, and we are sort of the largest coding academy here in Southeast Asia. And a lot of startup entrepreneurs and a lot of founders come out of our academy. So it was a great fit to interview <laughs> Rand on the startup culture and his experience, you know, with uh, Moz. Yeah. So, so uh, Ren, I, I really find your story in, uh, inspiring. You know how you started your company with your mom, and you know you you were at one point half a million dollars in debt. Yeah. And um, you know how 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 as an entrepreneur, sometimes a lot of times, uh, you know, as an entrepreneur, uh, we do find ourselves in debt. And in an Asian culture, it's sort of a thing that we are ashamed of. We don't. We are not transparent. We don't even tell people about our struggles. So, so how did you pull through? How did you sort of um, navigate through, you know, going through that and believing in your idea? Yeah, I think the, you know, the real answer is that um, at that time, I, I, felt, I felt a lot of shame as well. I felt like I couldn't talk about it, couldn't be honest about it. And, and I think that makes the problem only worse, right? Because you, you feel like you're the only one. You feel like everybody else, you know, in the startup world or entrepreneurship is doing great. And you're the only one who's struggling or suffering. And I think this is actually one of the biggest reasons that, um, that I wrote Lost and Founder is to help people feel less alone for having these challenges and these problems that, you know, this is something we universally experience. And a ton of startup success is actually just luck, right? It is, um, it's not that someone else is better than you or that they made, uh, you know, smarter decisions. It could be that their timing was just right. Their network was right. They were in the right place at the right time. And, um, and I think that we, you know, we have to, we have to recognize some of those things and, and attribute those things the way they should be. Even Bill Gates, right, says, hey, a ton of, a ton of my success, a ton of Microsoft success is the right place at the right time. I got really lucky. Uh, and I think that's, that's absolutely true. As far as, you know, being in debt goes and, and working through that, um, I mean, for me that, you know, for my mom and I, we, we really didn't feel like we had a choice. Uh, you can, of course, declare bankruptcy, but that goes on your kind of, you know, um, on your debt record, and we were, uh, you know, trying to keep our debt secret uh, from a lot of people, and so uh, from family in particular, and so we we felt like we just had to push through it and find a way to pay back those uh, those big sums, and eventually that worked out. But I I think that was a that was a long shot, right? This is this is one of the reasons that I I don't want to go into debt <laughs> anymore. I I pay my all my bills on time now. <laughs> Never carry any debt load. Great, great stuff. Um, you know, I, I love your book and how you talk about your, your whole journey, uh, founding Moss and the mistakes you made and you know, what you would have done differently. So it's, it's a great, um, great learning. And I wish everyone in Asia, especially I'm in the startup and tech scene. So everyone in Asia has your book. And um, in Asia, we also have like the, the big unicorns, you know, in, in Malaysia, that something that came out from my country is called Grab, which is the Uber in Asia. 
And you know, of course, everyone knows Alibaba. You know, and there, there are things like Traveloka, Gojek, which is the Uber Indonesia. So everyone here aspires you know, to be the unicorn. So I just want to get your thoughts on, you know, you don't always you know, have to be that unicorn. And that is very much covered in the book. Yeah. I, in fact, I, I think that most people, I think 99% of entrepreneurs probably should not try to be those unicorns. You know, one of the, the things that entrepreneurship provides, right, the uh, independence and ability to control your own destiny and uh, the ability to, to set the company culture the way that you want and to build something that you want the world, you want to exist in the world. Those are all wonderful things, and they don't, they don't require billions of dollars. They don't require market domination. They don't require you to be a monopoly. Uh, you can do all of those things with a small team, with you know, people that you want to work with, uh, building the kind of company you want to build. Financially speaking, uh, a company that is a unicorn, sometimes those companies make founders a lot more money, and sometimes they don't. There's a, there's, there are plenty of founders who have been part of early journeys of startups and then found themselves you know, pushed out along the way and owning less and less stock and um, diluted over and over again by new investors coming in and new classes of shares coming in. And so there, there is just a real uh, misunderstanding in the, in the startup world that you can have a a bootstrapped company or a company that's funded via uh, debt or a company that's crowdfunded or a company that is funded just from uh, angel investors or friends and family uh, or some of the new alternatives that are out there like um, like Tiny Seed Fund, uh, which, which my wife and I invested in. The, the, these formats of building a company can be you know, just as um, if not more so, uh, just as exciting, and they give you a much better survival rate, right? I think one of the one of the terrible things about pr trying to be a unicorn is that almost everyone fails, right? You the failure rates are you know ninety five plus percent. If you look at um, venture backed companies, right, mm -hmm. venture backed tech startups that have raised money from an institutional investor, yeah. 95% of them fail to deliver uh, the minimum rate of return that is required by the, by the investor. That, those odds are terrible, terrible odds. Uh, you, you can dramatically increase your odds of being successful by having a different definition of success and by not having to raise money from institutional capital. Yeah, and in, in your book, you extensively cover the, the downsides of venture capital funding to you know, downsides of raising money. Um, can, can we briefly talk about this? So because in Asia, it's a, still a very big thing, you know, to raise money and lots of money in Asia because there are a lot, the population here is still emerging. So emerging in terms of the economy. So there is a lot of fundraising going around. Unlike Silicon Valley, it's just starting here, you know? Yeah, I mean, I think that... Uh entrepreneurs need to ask themselves what they want to build and why, right? And, and venture capital, any, any investor will tell you, venture capital is wrong for 99% of companies. The problem is it's marketed to 100% of entrepreneurs. And so a lot of us are biased to think that uh, venture or, or growth equity are the right ways to go for, and, and we try and build our companies in a way that we can raise venture instead of building our companies toward the goal of profitability. Um, and once you're a profitable company, you have long-term sustainability. There is no longer a runway to worry about. There is uh, no longer do you need to have a concern of, am I meeting my investors' expectations? Am I going to be you know, fired from my, my job as CEO? Uh, or uh, fired by my company if I'm in a, a founder and you know executive role, those those concerns go out the window. So I, I think I think it just pays to question the prevailing you know notion of what it takes to be an entrepreneur. There are a lot of wonderful companies that have uh, either not raised money or raised alternative forms of capital, and 
I, I hope that, um, yeah, I hope that the Asian market can sort of learn from the American market's experience and go, hang on a minute. We don't, we don't need to be crazy like them. Like, let, let, let's take this a little more intelligently um, and, and plot out what we want to build. Yeah, and build like strategic partnerships with your investors and you know, understand the motivations of investors and make sure they look out for you, <laughs> not just their yeah, portfolio. I mean, make, sure that those, you know, make sure that those things are aligned. I think that oftentimes in the early stages, it can feel like you're very aligned with your investors. And then as you, um, as you grow, as the business changes, as you both see what the business can become, uh, those interests can diverge pretty dramatically. And so uh, there's a lot of, you know, it's a, um, a relationship built on trust. And I, I had a great relationship with, with Moz's investors. You know, I think that they were some of the best people in the venture world. Um, I think incredibly highly of them. And uh, if, you know, when, when my friends say like, hey, I want to raise venture, I definitely say, yeah, you should, you should talk to them. I think, I think Ignition was good. I think uh, Founder's good. But uh, the, just the structure of venture capital is uh, very prohibitive in terms of what kind of company you can build. You know, there's only one re really one path to success, and that, that is incredibly fast, hyper growth, which very few companies can achieve. Yeah. Yeah, great, great stuff. And and the, the the most painful, not painful thing, but the most painful thing that I read in your book is you talk about your your potential exit with HubSpot and like the almost exit, the offer from the acquisition offer from HubSpot. And that was yeah. a great, it was such a good thing that you shared. Not many people who have shared that. Um, and in Asia, I can tell you it's the same thing. It's the same culture here that, you know, startup founders don't exit it's because they said oh you know we have to keep the dream going we have to um we have to keep the, the money going and you know exits are sometimes even laughed upon or even like have bad press so it, it is important you know to balance having like the you know, venture capital fund but also bear in mind if it's it's not very good if you want to exit early so you know what of your thoughts on you know your entrepreneurs exiting. Yeah, I mean, I think that one of the one of the core things that you need to keep in mind as an entrepreneur is that um, exit opportunities are few and far between. They are they are hard to come by, and uh, if if you have an offer, even if it's not everything you ever dreamed it would be, but it is sort of life changing for you and your team and your family and your future. It might be it might be the right thing to say yes early on. I think one of the one of the things that that a lot of founders don't realize is that you get a lot of stabs at this, right? You get to you get to build multiple companies over your life. You don't just get one. And if you take an early exit opportunity, you are going to be far better set up for doing whatever you want, long term, short term, exit, no exit, in future companies. Right, because you you've removed a lot of that short-term financial pressure for you know you and your partners and uh, family and uh, people in your lives, and that's that's a really powerful thing. You know, I think that the um, the the struggle of you know reflecting on you know years and years uh, of of saying no to an offer. And and feeling like, gosh, what what would that experience have been like? You know, what did we miss yeah. out on? What what would it have been like to not um, to not be scared about our financial future and uh, the financial future of you know sort of people around us for for a long time? That uh, that's pretty enticing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Th thank you for being so transparent in in the book, and uh, I really love that. And one of the things that you continuously say in the book is. Um, that it is not, it is quite challenging to earn a lot of money or being lucrative, even as a founder of a fifty million dollar revenue company. You know, so that's that's great insight to a lot of people. That should be a great learning to everyone here in Asia. And thank you for sharing that. You know, it's not always the right thing, not not always the most um, you know lucrative thing to be a CEO of a fifty million dollar per year company. That's yeah, yeah. I mean, it's weird, right? That I think that a lot of people think 
you know, they see, they see Moz, I think Moz will maybe do, yeah, 50, $55 million um, in revenue this year. And it's sort of odd to have this um, expectation that, oh, you know, Rand started the company with his mom. They collectively own, you know, whatever it is, 35% of it. They, they must be, they must have money, right? And the, oh, the reality is not quite, <laughs> right? Like maybe someday, I mean, you know, knock on wood, hopefully someday Moz has a great exit and, and maybe that does come true. Uh, but whether it'll be as good of, as, as that, you know, that HubSpot offer, yeah. um, hard to say. It might not. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I, I wish you all the best, and hopefully after two years you have like lost and founder part two and talk about your exit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. Uh, one of the chapters are not one of the things that I really love from the book is also like you say, you always as a founder or CEO you always don't get to do what you love. You know, you might be starting out, you know, loving SEO, doing marketing, and you know, as a founder or CEO you might eventually be doing you know, running a company or fulfilling a vision. And that's, that's a great point that I really got out of the book. So can you tell my audience more about, you know, if the challenges of being a CEO? Yeah. Uh, so basically what I find over and over again is that lots of people uh, who build companies, especially in the early stages, are really good at doing whatever work it is that's required to build a company in that sector. You know, so it might be, wow, this person is a phenomenal content creator, phenomenal service provider, or, you know, they are wonderful at transactions and understanding, um, uh, you know, whatever it is, logistics, right? They're a great logistics person. But as you become a larger and larger company, as your company scales, especially, you know, in sort of classic venture world where you're aiming for hyper growth. So you're hiring very fast and, and adding a lot of people and complexity to your team. Uh, Sorry, Ren, you just froze. Enablement. Yeah. Oh, can you see me now? Yeah, yeah. Now, now it's great. I think you might need to repeat your last uh, 10 seconds. You just froze. Yeah. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah I see worries. the thing. Uh, internet connections unstable. Give me just a sec. Let me see if I can yeah. clean it up. Uh, yeah, it's great. It's great. No worries. Now it's great. Okay. Looks good. Looks good. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, basic story here is that um, when you are first building your company, you, you might be really good at the things that are required to build a company in that sector. And you might be very passionate about those things, right? I, mm -hmm. I built a company in the SEO world. I love SEO. I love learning about the ins and outs of how Google and web marketing work. I love, you know, uh, showing people, running experiments and showing people how particular things work and exposing the sort of underbelly of Google's operations. But that is not the work that's required of a CEO of a 200 person company. Right, that's really different, and uh, I think it can be very frustrating if you, as an entrepreneur, go into this you know company building world thinking that you're going to get to do the work that you love, rather than you're going to do a lot of work that you're not good at, don't like, uh, maybe even hate, because you're enabling the vision of what the company can eventually be. Right, you're trying to build a a team and build processes and build structures and set strategy and, you know, tell messages over and over to your, your team and to the outside world. Um, CEO is a very different kind of job than individual contributor. And so if you love the work of building an early stage company, you don't necessarily love the work of scaling that company in later stages. Yeah, that's a great point and absolutely love that in the book. Uh, so that because I, I know a lot of founders who scale and then they, they struggle to cope, uh, so like don't really love what they do anymore. So. Yeah. yeah, I mean, this is another, this is another wonderful thing, right? If you don't, if you don't raise capital, you don't have those um, sort of re capital return requirements. And so you are much more free to build a company that can uh, stay small, that can stay agile, that can be whatever you want it to be. And sometimes that means that you get to do whatever kind of work you want to do, which is awesome too. And the, 
you know, frankly, I think the world needs a lot more small companies. I, I like small companies. You know, I don't, I don't like going to Starbucks. I like going to the independent coffee shop, right? I don't, I, I don't love buying from Amazon and Walmart. I like finding some independent retailer that, you know, is doing something super cool in my neighborhood. Uh, if, if that's you, maybe small business is the way to go. Yeah, th thanks for saying you don't like going to Starbucks. You know? I, this, you're the first person that I talked to that, that's from Seattle, so that, that's great to hear. <laughs> and, and, yeah, I, Seattle, Starbucks is not popular in Seattle, right? Like here, we're kind of like, oh, oh my God, Starbucks, no, uh-uh. You got to go to an independent shop. You know, we have great coffee here, but that's not where you get it. Yeah, yeah, it's it's uh, the same here. Like great, uh, we like we love great independent businesses. I love you know family run businesses. That's where most of the heart is and most of the you know craft is, and uh, I love that until you know they acquire <laughs> sometimes. But I mean, I mean that's where you get right. Yeah, like that's where yeah. you get great food. That's where you get great products. That's where you get great innovation, and yeah, it all feels kind of generic and the same when you get you know the really big scale companies. Yeah, yeah, great stuff. And one, one of the points that I really like from your book is you said that, you know, the strengths and weaknesses of the founder, you know, would actually eventually transcend to the company. And I really love that whole chapter of the book. You know, can you briefly, in, in a summarized way, tell my audience how, how that is? Sure. Yeah, the basic, the basic issue here is that as a founder, you come with your personal human baggage, your, your emotions, your style, uh, the way you operate, the things you're good at and not good at. And as a founder, you transfer those things onto your company in ways that you might not always realize. Mm -hmm. And many, I think many startup founders uh, and many startup teams don't realize how the culture that's been created at the startup um, is is innately tied to who the founders are and yep. and where they have uh, emotional intelligence and where they might lack that and it can be very tough to unravel those things and then to be realistic about facing the consequences right to say gosh this attribute of rand has embedded itself in maz's culture and it's not a good thing i'll give you an example um, one of the things, Bob, that I was always terrible at, terrible at, was letting people go when I should have, yeah. right? Saying, this person is not a right fit for the company. We, we probably shouldn't have hired them or whatever it is. We're changing in a way that, that they no longer you know, are the right match for what we're building. And I, I did not do that. And I think as a result, um, Moz oftentimes had a had a culture that was, um, you know, where expectations were not clear and um, responsibility for doing the right work wasn't always clear. Uh, people who probably should have been let go, you know, months or years ago stayed on far too long. Mm -hmm. And that meant that, you know, they weren't a right fit with the rest of the company. Th that's no good for them. And it was no good for us. And yeah. Um, and, and recognizing those things in yourself, right? Having the self-awareness to say, oh, I'm responsible for that. I need to fix that. That's hard. That's a hard thing to do. You, you got to look yourself. Yeah, no worries. The, the connection seems to be a little funky. Okay. Looks good again. Yeah. Yeah. No worries. We'll, 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 we'll plow through. It's okay. Okay. <laughs> and um, yeah. So a lot of, you said just now, you know, some of the weaknesses do transcend and in, in the book you do talk about you know, some of your technical, um, you know, difficulties uh, mastering technical stuff, like, like you yeah. know, understanding tech and, you know, software engineering. So as, as an academy that teaches a full stack uh, web development coding program, so we teach people how to code from the front end to Python to build stuff, build applications. So should tech founders, my question is to learn to code before they start a company. Hmm. Mm. Let's see. I, I think it is helpful for sure, but not, um, not absolutely required. I, I know plenty mm. of founders who are relatively non-technical, mm. uh, 
either they only know the very basics of coding, but they, you know, they don't write any of their own code for the company, uh, or they don't at all. I, I think what's what's crucial though is that you, um, even if you are not actually writing the commands, right, and and programming in the language that is being used in your company, if you don't have a good understanding of software engineering and how um, how the architecture of uh, an application is built, that that is problematic. I think you know it. It is okay if you don't understand it going in, but when you start working with your team, they should be able to cogently and cohesively explain it to you, and you should be able to grasp those concepts and have a great understanding, so that when you are talking to your engineers about how long something is going to take to build, or how it's being architected, or why it's being done that way, you can understand what they're talking about. You can provide suggestions and input. You can ask good questions and, and dumb questions without fear of repercussion or reprisal. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's I think that's crucial. And that's not just true in, in, in tech, right? That's true. Mm -hmm. It's true in marketing and in sales and in growth. It's true uh, in finance. It's true in operations and logistics and hiring. Like all of these things, you know, you sort of need to be, have enough knowledge to be dangerous. Uh, otherwise, it, it can, you can quickly be, um, overrun by debt in those areas. Yeah, yeah, and it's not. Uh, it's I. I love the story where your your CEO actually took, you know, um, interest into the software engineering and learned to, to to understand the technical parts by herself. That's that's the amazing part of the book. <laughs> so. Um, I, I love my, my favorite chapter, of course, as you know, a person in marketing is the, the, the chapter about growth hacking. And, you know, you talk about, you know, your experiences with growth hacking. Um, and it's, it's still a big part of startup culture here in Asia. So can you share with us your experiences with growth hacking? Yeah. So I think the, the principles behind growth hacking and, and finding growth hacks have been that it's very short-term focused, right? You're essentially trying to find this one weird tactic that you can use to get a bunch of you know, users or customers or, or uh, people paying you. And uh, my experience and the experience of lots of other company founders has been that those tactics generally only work for a limited amount of time and they often have ugly externalities on the rest of the business. So I, I talk about this in the book, um, a bunch as it relates to Moz, but uh, I think that this is a fundamental flaw in the way you think about marketing. If, if you think about marketing as, how do I find that one weird trick that's going to bring me all my customers, you will almost certainly fail. Uh, even if you find that trick and it starts to work, you will almost certainly fail in the future. If instead you are building a sustainable what I call a flywheel, right? A, a structure that you can invest in over and over again and get uh, increasing returns with decreasing effort. Meaning, you know, I am putting in the same amount of work each week, each month, each day to acquiring new customers or acquiring new users, driving traffic to my site. And as I put in that same amount of work, I'm getting more and more people out of it because the, the process builds on itself. Mm. Or... Alternatively, you are investing less work over time and seeing increasing returns, e even better, right? That's a, that's a flywheel that's scaling with decreasing friction. You're getting better at doing all ki uh, whatever kinds of marketing. It could be advertising or press and PR or events and conferences or content marketing or SEO, whatever types of investment, email marketing, right? Uh, building a great email list and, and, and operating off of that. All of those tactics uh, can be invested in in ways that scale with decreasing friction. And boy, the difference is huge when you have a sustainable marketing practice versus a one-time hack that you know goes down that stops working over time. Yeah, and uh, I think everyone should get you know your book to to listen to the story of your growth growth hack for Moz or your growth hack <laughs> for Yelp. It's such an amazing story. And I think one of the, you know, the keys to growing Moz was that you um, 
you put out a lot of content and you build an audience you know throughout the years whether it's through email or through you know, youtube videos and, and and other channels so i want to ask you uh you think uh i i love your content i've been following for many years and, and i love your keynotes so like how do you come up with you know content ideas and how do you uh, how do you have the, the ability to speak to your audience? You know? um, I mean, certainly a lot of that is practice, right? Yeah. You know, you, when you do it for a long period of time, I think I've been, you know, I've been creating content for marketers for 16 years almost at this point. Yeah. Um, and I probably was, I was terrible at it for year one, two, three, and then I got kind of good in year four, five, six, and then um, uh, eventually pretty, pretty darn good. And I think that a big part of that is uh, empathy for an audience, right? So being able to say like, gosh, you know, I have conversations with a lot of startup founders, uh, a lot of CMOs, a lot of web marketers, a lot of SEOs, a lot of content creators. And I, I hear over and over again the, the same frustrations and challenges and concerns and issues and uh, lacks of, lack of understanding around something. And so when I find those, I can go dig into those areas and talk to people uh, in my network who've done a great job of solving them or find case studies of people who've done a good job and try and reverse engineer why that is and, and then produce content that makes uh, that, those concepts easily explainable and accessible to people. I think that's, that's kind of at the core of, um, of content marketing. It's also at the core of product development, right? I think in order to build a great product, you have to have deep customer empathy, mm -hmm. right? Being able to put yourselves in their shoes, imagine the problems they're having, imagine why they're having those problems, and then be able to uh, correctly work out solutions to those problems that will help make their lives better, right? Whether that's an enterprise uh, you know, business and we're going to make their lives better through this complex software or it's, you know, a consumer who needs to travel from point A to point B and we're going to find a great way to get them, uh, you know, to offer them something that's yeah. affordable and scalable and reusable that's a good experience. And that, that same product empathy, I think that's what, that's what helps me do marketing and content creation. Yep. So I, I love your story in, in the book, your transparency on the most analytic story. So, so it's so important to put yourself in your customer's shoes. Can you briefly tell us the story about you know, you know, understanding your customer and how it affected um, product development for you? Yeah, sure. So I, in the book, I tell an anecdote about um, uh, something I did with a friend of mine, we called it CEO swap. So I went and ran his company, which was a, a, a consulting agency out in Philadelphia for a week. And he went and ran Moz, my, my software company in Seattle for a week. And uh, as I spent a lot of time with his team members and the people doing you know, the SEO work, I saw that many of my assumptions about the market, about, about my customers, Moz, did their work was uh, not correct and seeing that in person living that experience uh, you know in, in this kind of funny odd way was very illuminating for me and and I think helped me to see the the problem the challenges that um, that Moz was facing with this Moz analytics product a product that we spent two plus years building and when we finally launched it was uh, pretty much a dud for at least the first six months after launch. And it, you know, it took a long time to sort of get, uh, get back to a, a good place. Now, uh, lesson learned, right? I think as I'm building SparkToro, uh, I am trying to talk to and watch and observe and do the work of my customers every week. Right? Every week for me is talk to a bunch of people who do marketing of all kinds and see how they, um, how they discover uh, uh, attributes of their audience, how they figure out where to target them, um, yeah. and then and then try and try and build a tool that 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 does a, a good job to help them. Yeah, I'll give you an insight. Uh, being part of this world, so 
uh, when it comes to MarTech or any SaaS software, first of all, uh, it's quite uh, unaffordable here. For us, paying anything in US dollars is quite a, uh, you have to be a sizable company to afford that. Sure, so, that makes sense. Like yeah. that HubSpot and everything, or thing, things like SEMrush, it's very, it's quite very pricey for us. So we, we are in the end where, you know, even being as in a small, medium company, we, we are very well versed with all the free alternatives. Ah, <laughs> yeah. so you could give, you can ask me for any feedback on that. We are very, any, every Asian company is very well versed with the free alternatives. It takes a lot for us to eventually jump to pay. Mm. Secondly, is that a lot of tools that are developed in the West um, don't have the insights we need here. You don't have yeah. our data. You don't have our interest targeting. <laughs> you don't have uh, a lot of things that works very well. Yeah, a lot of software works very well in the West. Don't work here too well. <laughs> um, yeah, I think that's. I think that's absolutely true. And this, is, um, in my opinion, that's a huge opportunity, right, for entrepreneurs yeah. uh, in Asia to say, like, "Hey, I understand this market," yeah. and whatever, you know, SEMrush, Ahrefs, Moz, HubSpot, Salesforce, they don't understand this market, but I understand this market. And so I can build great yeah. things uh, for this market and I can do so affordably, right? I, I know the pricing structures. I know how to price things properly. I know how to market them properly. I think that's powerful, right? Yeah, I, yeah. That's, a, that's a huge competitive advantage. Yeah, maybe you should come and start something here, maybe in the future. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I feel like before I do that, I need to, I yeah. need to spend you know, like a decade or two learning the market before I just assume that I know how to build for, for, for the Southeast Asian uh, community. Yeah, we have our own search engine, so we need, definitely need another MOS here. So that's, that's quite good. Um, well, I, yeah, I hope, uh, I hope you or, or, or someone in your network can, can build that. I think that's a great idea. Yeah. Um, so like the, the reason why I bring that up is because, you know, in your book, I love the part where you talk about the importance of diversity and how it shapes your product. So can you tell us your experience with having sort of like a more diverse team? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think this is so you, you bring up a perfect point, right? That if um, if your founders and your team all come from a single background, uh, geographic background or uh, a certain perspective, right? Uh, they just won't be able to target uh, a market that is outside of their comprehension. Um, you know, gr great example of this in, in the United States, I, I don't know how, how true this is in other countries, although I'm sure it is um, at least significant, but at any given time in the United States, there are about 20% uh, of the population um, has a lot of trouble being ambulatory, like being able to walk uh, without assistance from one place to another. And that's both because, you know, folks who are elderly, folks who um, break, break their leg, right? And they have a, they have a broken bone, doesn't matter what age they are. Uh, folks who, who have um, health issues, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Unfortunately, it is not the case that the founders at, uh, at Uber and Lyft for many years they, they had no one who had a disability on their executive teams or in their, um, you know, uh, on their strategy and product planning teams. And so they just, they just had no support for this. You know, if you were disabled, well, I, I don't know what they use. I guess that they can't use us, right? It's super frustrating and, and just a complete, you know, complete oversight miss. If you had had some people uh, in those discussions in those conversations who ha who either had those issues themselves or were deeply connected to those communities there you go right you you probably get a much more robust much more thoughtful intelligent strategic conversation around hey how can we serve those users and now now they're doing a better job right but it took a long time i think that's true for every kind of community right um yeah there is uh there are just fundamental differences um, between uh, different groups all around the world, Ge geographic differences and uh, disability differences yeah. and uh, ethnic background differences, language differences, cultural differences. If they're not represented on your team, 
mm. you're not going to do a good job representing them to your customers. Yeah. So, so you, you talked about Uber. So Uber um, sort of it, uh, merged with a local company here because they, to, to you know, better understand the market, they merged. Yeah, them. they felt like they didn't understand. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I read about that. I think that they're a great example. Yeah. Yeah. That, that company is from where I'm from. It's Malaysia. It's called probably the biggest ride sharing um, company here in, in the region. <laughs> so great stuff. Thanks for sharing that. And I think it's very important to have like different opinion, different point of views and different opinions from, from the, from the team. And it's, it's what uh, we're trying to grow. Um, yeah. <laughs> and, and now, now towards more, more to like people in marketing, um, a lot of our digital marketing graduates, uh, graduate to become a consultant, you know, they, they become a marketing consultant, consulting uh, multiple companies, like how you started with Moz, you know, doing websites and doing consulting. So one of the very great uh, chapters in your book is you said how to escape the service, hem service hamster wheel. So uh, can you tell the story of how you transition from being a, like a consultant to a, uh, you know, a SaaS uh, model? Yeah. I mean, I think, One really important thing to realize in terms of why Moz was able to transition from services, from consulting to product to software, is that we already attracted the right audience, the right customer base to our website uh, via the content that we created for the software product, right? So many, many people, many consultants and agencies and in-house SEOs uh, who needed SEO software were visiting Moz's website already. They knew us, they liked us, they trusted us uh, to provide them with things. So when we launched the software, it had an audience that was receptive to it. And a lot of people who try to make the transition from services, from consulting over to product, think that the same customers who buy their services will also buy their product. And that is almost never true. Almost never true. People who need consulting want consulting they want a human being they want a team they don't they don't want software that you put in front of them that you're like look now this does a lot of the things that we were doing for you manually uh, okay maybe it does i don't care i don't want to learn a new tool i want you to do it that is why i hired you people right human beings to get on the phone with me and deliver reports and come to my offices and and talk to me that's why i need consulting help if you are trying to sell software to your consulting audience, it usually fails. The reason Moz has worked is because we did not. Almost none of, I don't think any of our consulting clients became software customers. They, all of our software customers were people who were reading our blog and consuming our content and coming in this different way. So I, I, I'd urge a lot of caution there. Don't get fooled into thinking you can just sell one to the other. Yeah, uh, talking about consulting, I love your chapter where you talked about consulting business. It's not always bad to be in a consulting business. Uh, yeah. No, those businesses can be awesome. I, I have so many, yeah, I, I mentioned this in the book, but I have so many friends who run consulting businesses and, you know, financially speaking, have done much better than I've done building much smaller, much smaller, but self-owned consulting businesses. Yeah, great. Um, great stuff. Um, so uh, one, one of the things I really want to ask you, and I, I heard you say this in another podcast, and just a quick one before we go off, um, is you talk about, you know, you don't always have to build bad links. You, you talked about it on the show podcast with Tom Casano. So that's a great interview. So you talk about, you know, the, the best way to build bad links is actually to build a brand. Um, yeah. And and I I love your example on that. And so, can you tell my audience, you know, how how do you build uh, backlinks in twenty nineteen? I mean, I think one of the easiest, one of the sorry, one of the best ways to consistently earn links without having to work for everyone is yeah. to build a a company, a product, um, or a, a set of content that. Uh, naturally is built to attract links. What I mean by that is that you are uh, strategically thinking about who are the people who could link to 
this thing on the web yeah. and why would they do so? And, and if you have a great answer to that, right, if the answer is, oh, there are lots of reporters who are looking for a story around whatever, um, a big demographic shift in Asia, or they're looking for stories about um, serving expats, or they're looking for stories about uh, diversity and inclusion. They're looking for stories about um, uh, startups that are funded in different ways than venture capital. Yeah. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna play all of those threads. We're gonna play all of those angles in our business so that we are naturally attracting coverage, stories, attention, awareness. It doesn't have to be from press, right? You can you can broaden this out to say, oh, there are lots of websites uh, out there in our space that cover uh, that link to anyone with an event. Cool. Yeah. How do we make sure that we are a host of big events? How do we make sure that we consistently have events that lots of people are talking about and linking to? Uh, how do we have, um, if, if, if you are in a space where a lot of research work needs to be done and lots of people will link to and point to research, how do we make, how do we tie our product and our customer data and our, you know, whatever we're building into that research that everyone's looking for? I think when you ask those questions, you can, yeah naturally build up a business that is attracting links without you having to do the work every time. Yeah. Ren, can you give the quick example of the, like, I think you said the gelato shop, uh, the Italian gelato shop that I think to give like a more concrete example to my audience. Oh, um, yeah. yeah, I'm trying to remember that one. So, so basically uh, my, my cousin-in-law, Marco, yeah. started a, a gelateria here in Seattle and you know, his, it was, it was, very easy for them to get a lot of attention at the time that they launched because you know it was an authentic Italian gelateria. He and his uh, he and his father Enzo had had taken classes on on making gelato in Italy, and they brought over um, a lot of the methodology. And so you know, of course, the Seattle food community, which is I, I don't know uh, how this is in, in Asia, but in the United States, there's like an obsession with Italian food, right? And uh, yeah. And so the, the perception, it just played all the right cards um, and sort of hit these uh, great reasons for people to write about it. And so, yeah, a lot, as soon as they launched, right, there was lines out the door just all the time. Uh, for the first like two years, you, you couldn't go by the place. Even in winter, there's always a line. Um, yeah. There you go. Yeah, and uh, it's, it's, when you build a, a great product, it's also easier to get featured in press you know, get featured in uh, event sites and, and, you know, new sites. So that's where if you build a great product and the, the right word of mouth, uh, that's where you get great backlinks as well. So, yeah, so that, and it's, not just, it's not just like the right product, but a product yeah. that people naturally want to talk about and amplify, right? Yeah. So in, in some cases, right, um, you know, if you build um, a great uh, um platform for uh in, for investor research yeah investors don't really want to share that with anybody right they don't they don't have anybody about it right so so you have to kind of do something more you have to gear your product to uh, or some aspect of your product or your content to an audience that wants to amplify and that is fundamentally different from just making a great product. So I think that's what oftentimes where the disconnect comes in. I'll see lots of people saying like, we have the best product. <laughs> yeah, but who wants to talk about it? Yeah. Great stuff. So thank, thanks for the time, Ren. Uh, last question. And, and the startup scene or the, the startup scene and the tech scene is just, it's, it's already quite uh, emerging here in Asia. And there are a lot of, uh, you know, first time founders and people starting up their own tech company. Um, so what is your advice? Uh, so in your book, you talk about, you know, going through depression and going through the tough times. Um, so what is your advice, you know, for entrepreneurs when it com comes to, you know, go going through depression and, you know, their own struggles or anxiety? Yeah, I mean, um, 
that issue is different for every different person. And so I don't, I don't want to try and say that uh, if you, you know, if you just do this one thing or these few things that, that it'll solve the problem. It, it, that's not the case. Yeah. Um, a lot of times with, you know, with mental health stuff, um, it is very, very unique to every different person. And what works for some people won't necessarily work for you. But I, I will say that, the things that seem to be most closely correlated with, with being able to manage those issues. Um, first one is sleep. I, I think that there's, unfortunately, in the entrepreneurship world, there's a, um, people wear a lack of sleep on their, on their shoulder, like, like it's a badge of honor. Like, oh, I only slept four hours last night. I'm working so hard. Look, no offense, but you're an idiot. Uh, you you are actively hurting yourself. You are making worse decisions, right? There's tons of research about this. Take someone who gets four hours of sleep a night, compare them to someone who gets eight hours of sleep a night, test results, uh, uh, ability to drive well, ability to make good decisions, ability to uh, be thoughtful, ability to um, make good decisions about hiring, all will be better from this person. And what the hell is your job as an entrepreneur? What is your job? Your job is to make great decisions. So if you want to upgrade the quality of the decisions that you make, get more sleep. Get more sleep and you will massively improve your quality of work. And, and oftentimes you will uh, be able to avoid a lot of the mental health and burnout and anxiety and depression issues that, that plague our field. Um, that, that being said, uh, there are definitely other things. I, I think that therapy um, is a wonderful thing, right? Being able to talk to someone professionally about uh, why we do the things that we do, why do we behave in the ways that we behave, and how can we potentially change our behavior by recognizing patterns, unhelpful patterns, self-sabotaging patterns from the past, uh, recognizing why we have those, and then making conscious, conscientious efforts to change them in the future. Uh, that that can be wonderful as well. Yeah. Um, I think it's also really good to talk about this stuff. If you are feeling anxiety and depression, talking with your friends, with people who care about you, uh, with people who are going through the same thing is huge, is yeah. hugely helpful. When you feel alone, I think that's when um, that's when it really leads to terrible things. Yeah. I love the the story where you told multiple times in your book is where you sh you shared the diagnosis of cancer of your I'm, I'm sorry is your wife uh, oh yeah the brain surgery yeah. yeah and and it sort of had the reverse effect and it made the team pull together you know. uh, can you briefly tell that story um, to my audience um, yeah I I actually have to wrap up real quick but yeah yeah um, sure, sure. yeah um, but yeah very briefly. You know, my, um, yeah, my wife, Geraldine, was, was diagnosed with a brain tumor. And um, I think this is the kind of thing that, that people don't always share. But uh, I, I did share that with the, with the team at Moz um, publicly. And I think that um, the, the response, which was, was, which was an outpouring of love and caring and support, was really, um, yeah, really helpful for me, for us, for... Um, for the team too. Yeah. Yeah. Great stuff. I really value your time. So everyone should get uh, Rand Fishkin's book. You know, uh, it's at the back where Lost and Founder um, and everyone in the tech scene or founder should really get your insights of your experience in running a company such as Moss. So thank you so much, Rand, for your time. Uh, thank you, Bob. Bye. Really appreciate you having me. Take care. Thank you. Bye.